Okay. You guys, uh, Ron Johnson asked me earlier, he goes, you guys, you're going to give me the, the full load today? And I told him I actually had a week off to think about it, so you might get more than the full load today. So uh, I did have, I appreciate the time to be able to go back and spend with our family um, over the holidays. It was very refreshing to have a couple of days where I didn't really have to do anything but sit around in my pajamas and let my mom do all the cooking. So, <laughs> so I appreciate that. But it does give you some time to reflect. And so I'm going to... Uh, going to finish up this we've been doing this series on gratefulness and what the bible says we should be grateful for and then how do we express that gratitude or what does the bible say we should do to express that gratitude and so we talked about the fact that we all have a certain amount of um, things that we have and situations that we're in that we don't deserve but god has just shown grace to us and so that we, in the way that we express that gratitude for that is the idea of first fruits, that we take a portion of whatever that is that we didn't earn and we give it back to God in some way. Um, that's the first week. Then another week we talked about the idea that he's given us a way to deal with our shame, where we have all done things that we know we shouldn't have done or, or feel guilty about, and he's given us a way to not only just deal with our shame but to remove our shame and to give us honor and we express gratitude for that in the idea that because of that I'm going to obey and I'm going to serve and that's what the Bible prescribes us to do when we're grateful for him giving us um, an ability to remove our shame this week I want to talk a little bit about meaning and purpose and, the, and one of the greatest tragedies in the human condition right now is that the world is full of suicide and suffering. And a lot of times that is dealt with the fact that people look at the world and they say it's all meaningless and it's all useless. And they can become hopeless. And they have no purpose. And that is a very depressing thought. And it's a thought that has come through in in philosophy for a hundred years now that there's no meaning there's no purpose that we all just march to the beat of our genes our selfish genes that we are just products of our chemical reactions in our body and so therefore there's no meaning and everything I choose and I decide is meaningless and useless and that has led to despair and that has led to ultimately many people saying why not suicide why not end my life but I think there's a bigger problem there and I don't know have you ever noticed like looked at something and said you know there's something wrong with this but I can't really put my finger on it there's something wrong going on in the world and I just can't put my finger I don't know exactly what it is but there's something that's just not right and I heard a story this week which was pretty funny and pretty interesting to me the guy was telling the story of there was a foreman on a construction crew. And he was responsible to stay there and make sure that nobody stole things from the construction site. So they had cameras and they had things. And sure enough, somewhere along the lines, here comes some guy. And he's got a wheelbarrow with an empty box that he's leaving the construction site with. So the foreman goes up to him and says, well, obviously there's a box there, so he must be stealing something. So he goes and confronts the man and he looks in the box and it's completely empty. So he goes, well, that's kind of weird, so he lets the guy go. Next day comes around, and here comes the same old guy with the same old wheelbarrow, the same old empty box. He stops him again, thinking there's something in the box this time, and so he opens the box again, and it's completely empty. Well, that's really weird. I really thought you were stealing something, so he let the guy go. Third day comes around, here comes the same old guy, same old wheelbarrow, same empty box and he goes maybe he's hid something in the tire you know maybe he that's what he's doing so he pulls the tire off the rim opens the tire nothing in the tire nothing in the wheelbarrow pats the guy down there's nothing on the guy's body he's not stealing anything so he lets the guy go again and this goes on for three weeks three weeks and finally he walks up to the guy and he says you know what he goes i promise that i will not get you in trouble at all but you've been going in and out of here with a wheelbarrow and an empty box all for three weeks I cannot figure out what you're doing I know you're stealing something I know you're doing something wrong but I don't know what it is so can you tell me what you're doing and I won't I won't get you in trouble because oh that's easy I'm stealing wheelbarrows 
there's something wrong. You just can't put your finger on it. It's so obvious. It's obvious. The guy was walking in and out with wheelbarrows for weeks, and he couldn't figure out there's something wrong. And that's kind of how I feel about our culture today. There's just something not right. There's just something. You watch the news, and it's mind-boggling what's going on in our culture. There's something not. We fight over the dumbest things. We have protests about protests. It's insane. There's something wrong with our culture, and I can't, we can't put our finger on it. And it's deep. It, it's, it's deeper. It's not just the fact that we fight. There's something, there's been a culture shift. There's been a shift in our culture for, for decades and probably centuries. There's been basically two kinds of cultures in the world. There's been an honor culture. This would be your eastern cultures, your cultures that are based on if you come at me and you dishonor me in some way, then I'm going to stand up and I'm going to defend my honor. I have to defend my honor in some way. Military cultures are somewhat like this too. But the idea, if, if you think back to World War II, in the, in the Japanese empire, it was considered dishonorable to be captured alive by the United States forces. So the only way to regain your honor was to, to die in some sort of a suicidal attack or something along those lines. That was the only way to reestablish your honor if you were captured. So many times after we'd captured a Japanese soldier, a lot of times what they would do is they would run, grab a hold of a soldier and pull his grenade pin or something along those lines so that he could regain his honor. Then there's another culture what we would call a dignity culture. And these cultures are based on the fact that if you were to wrong me in some way, that you and I would go into a room, we would have a discussion, and then we would come out, hopefully, and say that we've come to some sort of amenable solution and that we're not going to deal with this anymore. And that, and that would be the dignified thing to do. And we operate in dignity about the sovereignty of individual people. I don't know if you've noticed or not that neither one of those two actually define our culture today. None of them. They, they don't. There's no such thing as going into a room and coming out with a mutually uh, beneficial thing. There, that doesn't happen anymore. And we don't really believe that we need to defend our honor in some way. That, that neither one of those things defines our culture. We've had a culture shift. And that culture shift, we have something what's called now a victim culture. Now, before you get all upset with that, I don't mean that we're going to start attacking, you know, we hear all these capture phrases like, you know, snowflake generation or things like that. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is, a, is we live in a culture now where you gain most of your status by how much you've been victimized in some way. Your status is dictated by have you suffered as much as somebody else has? And have you been oppressed in some way? That's how we gain status. If you don't believe me, you can, we can look at it in, in a lot of ways, but let's look at it from a movie standpoint. Anyone ever watch the original Superman movie? I know some of you have, right? Or at least read the Superman comics back in the day. Other than kryptonite, what was Superman's weakness? Can't think of one, can you? There wasn't one. He was morally perfect, socially perfect. He was, he was an upright citizen. The only thing you could do to bring Superman down was bring a big green gem called kryptonite to him, and that would, uh, that would be his weakness. Now... Some of you may not have watched the more modern interpretations of Superman. I have, because superhero movies are awesome. <laughs> but other than that, I've watched them. And it, but here's one thing I've noticed about superhero movies. It's primarily Superman. If you watch the beginning of Man of Steel, it is nothing about Superman not being able to find himself, doesn't know his identity, has, he has daddy issues, he's got all these things going on. Even Superman has to be a victim in order to be relevant in our culture. Even Superman does. 
We live in a victim culture. It's even worse than that. Here just last year, there was a lady in the UK. And I promise, we'll get to Bible verses in a minute, so don't, don't lose me. Just, just last year in the UK, there was a, a lady who is not, she was an atheist, and she started, she wrote, she's one of the biggest civil rights leaders in the UK at the time. And she wrote a story about transgenderism, and she used a few words that I shall not use in the church that had four letters and things like that that I'm not going to repeat. But she came out against certain things, certain ideals of the transgender movement. And it wasn't short, it wasn't very long after that where the, the uh, student union of the university that she taught at got together and decided that they want to, wanted to ban her from actually being able to teach and speak at university campuses all over Great Britain. And if that wasn't enough, so then there's another guy who was actually one of the biggest proponents and advocates of same-sex marriage. He actually wrote in favor saying, you can't come against her. She was just giving her opinion about something. You can't come against her. So then the student union banned him from teaching at campuses. So then there's a guy by the name of Richard Dawkins. Anyone ever heard of Richard Dawkins? He is one of the most virulent, angry, atheist writers on the planet. He's written books like The God Delusion. He's actually said you ought to come out and mock Christians in the street. That's this guy. And he comes out and says, and he's probably been at more Britain, you know, British universities than you can possibly think of speaking. And he comes out and says, you, you can't come and get... You, what kind of a generation calls the biggest same-sex marriage advocate calls him a homophobe because of the fact that he comes out in defense of somebody else? So then they ban Richard Dawkins. Do you want to see a pattern going on here? So the victim culture is defined this way. It's defined in the fact that everything that I do is always based out of love, 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 love. But everything that you do, if it disagrees with me, is hate, hate, hate. So if you disagree with me, you're full of hate speech. You hate whoever it is that you said anything about. Hate, hate, hate. And it's so subjective. So as long as you agree with me, we're all about love. But if the minute you disagree with me, you hate me, and you hate some aspect of me. That's our culture. There's a problem with this. Eventually this leads to what I call anti-anti, which means we have protests against protests. We, we begin to protest the fact that they're protesting. Let me give you an example of this. I was just talking to Janelle about this. About completely blew up in my office before I left on Tuesday. About completely lost it because there's this news story of there was a, we live in a culture where, there, where we had the Me Too movement and now because of that, now we have a hashtag Him Too movement. And so there was a group of guys who were protesting somewhere because they didn't, they, they didn't like the Me Too movement, so now we hashtag Him Too movement. So then here comes another group of people called Antifa, which stands for anti-fascist. And they come and they start hitting and spitting on the hashtag For Him movement who are protesting the hashtag Me Too movement. Are we seeing again a pattern here of crazy insaneness? And here's the thing that blows my mind. If you're anti-fascist, why are you using fascist things like hitting and violence and things like that to suppress the speech of somebody else. She became a fascist to protest fascism. It's insane culture. And I find myself, maybe you don't, but I find myself going, holy cow, what are we supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to operate in a world where the minute I disagree with someone, I'm a hate monger? How am I supposed to operate that way? So what some churches have done is they've just embraced it, and they said, okay, well, then we will not disagree with anybody. Problem is, 
there's too many things in here that disagree with things. And I can't not do that. I can't not disagree with someone when they say things that are clearly false. So how do I do it? I think as Christians, we have three paths that we can take. We can choose to take the bait, and we can follow this vortex of destruction. And we can actually begin to actually think that we can have logical debates about this stuff. And we see this in the church today. There are, we had people in one church that I was at, we had people that left the church because the pastor wouldn't preach on politics enough. Because people had taken the bait. They think that the church is here to debate the politics of something. And we're not. That's not what the church is here for. I could care less. We're not here to debate right versus left. You're not going to ever hear me endorse one candidate or another. You're not going to do it because that's not what the church's job. But that's what a lot of churches and a lot of Christians have done. I have seen more Christians spew more garbage on Facebook about things that really are irrelevant to anything because they've taken the bait. And now they're a part of this vortex where it is nothing but this back and forth discussion that, that ends up in insulting each other and everything else. And if you, all you have to do is look at one Facebook conversation about one of these controversial topics, and that's all you'll see is, well, you're an awful person because you want to take my rights. Well, you're an awful person because you want to kill young people in schools. And you're an awful person, blah, 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 back and forth, back and forth. That's one option. Another option, which I've seen Christians take, which I'm tempted to take this way sometimes, but I know I shouldn't, is we can just sit back with our arms crossed with a bag of popcorn and watch the world burn itself down <laughs> and enjoy the entertainment. You guys have a good old time destroying yourself, and when you're all done, we'll control the world because I'm just going to sit back here and, and enjoy, the, enjoy the show. But over and over and over again, the Bible tells us we're to engage the culture. We're supposed to go out into the culture. Jesus says you go out. You go into the world and you make disciples among all people and all faiths and all religions. We're called to go out. So that's not something we can do either. So the only other option is to really look at the scripture and what does the Bible tell us to do when it comes to engaging our culture? What does the Bible tell us to do? How do we operate? How do we fulfill our purpose? This is the one thing, this is the thing I want to talk about that we should be grateful for, that Christians have been given an incredible purpose, an incredible mission. And we, because of that, because of that purpose, I can have meaning in my life, and I should be grateful for that. And the way I show my gratitude and purpose is by sharing that purpose and that meaning with other people. But how do I do that? That's the part I want to answer today. Yes, all that was an introduction. Yes. See, they decided to sing short songs, so I had longer to preach. That's the way it works. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at, and the best part is, you might have to turn your Bibles with me because I didn't give them any verses back there. So you guys are in a whole lot of fun times. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. And that's right, for right now, we're going to read just verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 says this, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Now, I spent a good portion of my life picking up the Bible, just reading through a chapter, and not stopping to think about anybody or anything. Just read through it and hope that somehow through some osmosis process, that I'm going to learn something. So I started doing this thing where I take maybe one or two or three verses and I just start asking questions about the verse. And one of the things that pops out of me, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1, is this. Who in the world is Sosthenes? So I, most of us, if you've been in church even for one or two times, you've heard of the name Jesus in that passage. You've heard his name. If you've been in church for any length of time at all, you've probably heard, at least heard the name, the Apostle Paul. But I, I had never, who in the world is Sosthenes? It's not Timothy. We've heard of Timothy. It's not Titus. We've heard of Titus. It's not Apollos. It's none of these great names of the faith that we've heard a lot about. What? Who in the world is this guy? Well, 
in order to really understand who this guy is, we're going to have to turn back to Acts. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, I'm going to read through verse 17. So after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. So he's in Corinth. We just read 1 Corinthians, same city. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, of Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your heads, I am innocent. For now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Eustus, a worshiper of God. And his house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of question about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge in these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and here we go, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So let's kind of recap this story a little bit. Paul goes into Corinth, and he goes and does the thing that he does all the time. The first thing he does is he goes into the synagogue and tries to reason with his fellow Jews about Jesus being the Messiah that's been promised. And as most times happen, the Jews says, you're a crazy man, and they kicked him out. And he said, all right, well, fine, if you're going to be that way, your blood's on your hand. I'm going to go preach to the Gentiles for a little bit. And so he goes and preaches to the Gentiles, but what happens is there's this guy by the name of Crispus who is the head of the synagogue whose house is right next to the synagogue. And this guy named Crispus who's the head of the synagogue, one of the Jews, becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. And this makes the rest of the Jews mad and angry. They are so angry at Paul for this. And so what they do is they go to the new ruler of the synagogue named Sosthenes and they start causing a fit. And so Sosthenes brings an actual legal case against Paul for inciting some sort of insurrection against them and takes it to this guy named Gallio. And Gallio is a really interesting character. Gallio is actually this one of like two or three most powerful men in all of Rome. He's got a brother who tutors in Caesar's palace. This guy is very powerful. And they bring this law case to Gallius. And Gallio says, you know what? This is about your guys' law and your guys' traditions and your guys' everything else. I don't want anything to do with this whatsoever. So he dismisses the case. Kicks him out of the, <laughs> kicks him out of the courtroom. Get out. This is dumb. Get out of here. I kind of feel that way sometimes when I'm counseling with people. It's like, really? <laughs> we ought to be over this by now. Let's go. Not here, somewhere else. I've never had to do that here. But anyway, so he says, get out of my courtroom. This is ridiculous. And so the Jews get really angry again, and this time, what do they do? They attack Sosthenes, their own leader. They attack him and beat him to a pulp outside the synagogue. So here's the question. How did Sosthenes, a ruler of the synagogue who brought a legal case against Paul, get mentioned 
in a letter to the Corinthians later. Now, we don't know for sure. We don't hear some great story about some great conversion of Sosthenes. But I suspect it might have something to do with the Apostle Paul looking at Sosthenes with great compassion, beaten to a bloody pulp. Paul recognizing, you know, it wasn't too terribly long ago, like last week or something like that, that I was in that same position. And he reached out a hand and he said, here, Sosthenes, let me tell you about a man named Jesus. Let me reach down to the man who persecuted me. Let me reach down to the man who brought violence and anger against me. He reached out to him and led him to Jesus. And now when we look at 1 Corinthians 1, he goes, Hi, I'm Paul. You remember me? The guy who's an apostle of Jesus Christ. I bid you hello from Jesus Christ. And by the way, do you remember Sosthenes? Do you remember him, this guy that was so opposed to us, that so hated us, that he tried to sue us in front of the most powerful man in the entire region whatsoever? Do you remember him? He says hi from Jesus too. See, every, almost every other letter, it's either Paul or Paul and Titus or Paul and somebody else. It's someone that we've heard a lot about or there's another book of the Bible named after him. Not this one. Paul wanted the Corinthians to know something, that there's something. And if you look at the, the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, it is very specific about dealing with the unity and dealing with uh, this idea of reconciliation between the two. And in order to get that point across, the very first thing he says to them is this guy who was opposed to us that was reconciled to God, he says hi to. He wants you to know that he says hi and he remembers you. The book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians has to deal completely with this. See, the Bible says that Christians have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Let's, we can read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though once we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. First of all, let's stop there. When he says, I don't regard anyone according to the flesh anymore, that's not like, well, I don't just look at you like simple human beings. No, that's when he says according to the flesh, there's this epic war that battles and we can look at people and when we look at people we see them as either part of the kingdom of God or part of the kingdom of darkness and we don't so but we don't look at them just like they're just normal people walking the earth anymore and what that means is we as Christians don't go around just looking I don't look at the every person I see a random stranger as just some random stranger anymore that person is a person that was created in the image of God and is part of this grand scheme that God has written for the entire earth, and he has an eternal destiny, heaven or hell, and he is important to God and therefore should be important to me. It doesn't matter who I come across. Every random person that comes in this door that I've never met before has that same purpose and that same desire, that same goal, that I should look at them and not see them as just a person, but as a person that God loves and cares for, and so should I. And the Apostle Paul is saying that we no longer view anyone according to the flesh, according to this idea that they're just some other person. We no longer view anyone that way. They're loved and they're cared for. Rant over. He says, we don't view anyone according to the flesh. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled himself, us to himself, and here it is, and gave us the ministry of, of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He gave us this ministry of reconciliation. He gave us this idea 
that it is up to the Christians to put away all of their own hurt, all of their own things, to set that aside and reach across to the people, very people that hate them and persecute them. To beg them in some word. He says, I beg you, be reconciled to God. That is our purpose. That is our meaning in life as a church and as believers is that we no longer regard people according to the flesh. We no longer look at them as just people anymore. But we see them as God sees them. We see them as people that have value and worth. And we lay down every hurt, every pain that we've ever experienced, even by them, and we reach down and we pick them up because the world has beat them down. And we pick them up. And we say, let me tell you about a man named Jesus. Who loves you, cares for you, died for you. I heard another story this week. There's a guy that by the name of Michael Ramsden. A guy by the name of Michael Ramsden, who um, he travels around preaching, and uh, but he's he grew up actually in the Middle East. And he actually had a chance this last year. He, he wouldn't tell the name of this person, because obviously because of the sensitiveness of the matter, but he had a chance to go meet with someone who is a pretty large sponsor of terrorism in the world, to just sit down and have a conversation with this terrorist. <laughs> you know, that's not something I think about in my life. Boy, I, someday I hope I can sit down across from a terrorist and have a conversation with him. But he did. He had this chance to go meet this guy who was sponsoring terrorism all over the world. And the guy walks in, and before any other part, no, hello, how's it going? Nice to see you. No pleasantries. He just sits down across from Michael Ramsden, and he says this. Does anyone that believes the wrong thing, does anyone that believes the wrong thing, does their life have any value whatsoever? an interesting question. Michael Ramsden, being the very wise man that he is and didn't want to get shot at that particular point, said, well, what do you think? <laughs> and he goes, it's a very, very smart question. The guy says, no, I don't think they have any value at all. He goes, from what I've seen in my entire life, even in my own world, when people come to us, nobody changes never seen someone actually change who they are. They might be able to change some of their thought process, but at the end, they always act the same way they've always been. So, that means that the only thing that we can do is change how we think. And when people refuse to change what they believe and believe the wrong thing and do the only thing that they can do, then their, their life has no value whatsoever because they won't even do the one little thing that they can do. And we start to see why he is perfectly willing to kill thousands and thousands of people all the time because their life has no value because they believe something different than he does. And they think something that he thinks he's right. They don't have any value. But there's a difference. Michael Ramsden looked at this guy and he goes, well, actually... Have you ever heard of the story of the prodigal son? And the guy says, no, I haven't. And he tells him the story about the prodigal son. We've all heard it, right? Here's the son. Comes to his dad and says, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance. Do you know what that actually means? What that actually means is, Dad, I've been waiting long enough, and you're taking too long to die, so just give me my money now. Which would be a, considered an insult in any generation, in any culture. He says, give me my inheritance, I want to go now. And he goes and wastes all of his money, wastes everything he has. And he comes back, and before he even gets to the gate, here's this picture of the father binding up his robes, which is another show that he was willing to bear the shame because of the fact that in that culture you didn't show your legs to people. It was considered shameful. Then he lifts up his robe and he runs out to meet his son, and before the son says a word, he's already offered him forgiveness for everything that he believed wrong and everything that he did wrong. Before he said a word, 
Forgiveness comes before that. And this terrorist gets up and he explodes. Nobody lives that way. There's no father in the world that can actually live that way. There's none that will actually do that. He went on this 20-minute rant. I guess at one point he said something like some phrase that makes me want to put my hand on the handle of my gun. I don't think that's a good place to be. He goes on this rage, and then finally when he was done, Mike Ramsden looks at him and he says, but Jesus wasn't talking about a father here. He was talking about God himself. That God can love that way. God can forgive that way. God can bring reconciliation. Jesus reconciled us to God. And then the crazy thing. Not only do I reconcile you to God, but now I'm giving you this ministry of reconciliation. It is time that the church stops this idea that somehow we can wage war the same way the world wages war with all this rhetoric and all this stuff. And we embrace the gift and the ministry of just reaching out a helping hand and reconciling with ourselves and with the world. This ministry of reconciliation, this ministry of the cross, and, what, and it even defines what is reconciliation in that. It says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And he says, That is, reconciliation is, Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's what Christ was doing. Then he says he's given that responsibility to us. So what that means is we can read, we should not count the trespasses against them. Because he's given us the same reconciliation ministry that we should not consider and not remember the sins against us that people have committed. This reconciliation. I'm absolutely convinced that the church needs to spend less time dealing with politics and more time dealing with people. There's right and there's wrong, and I think you should vote based on right and wrong and all those things, but I'm more interested in seeing what happens. What do you think is more effective? Let me just, let's get real personal here. What do you think is more effective? Standing in front of an abortion clinic with a sign Or spending time with a person considering abortion. What one's more effective? What one do you think will produce the most results? I like Marlon back there. Yeah, I go with door number two. It's not about the policy. It's about the person. And the church has spent so much time and so much money trying to change policy that we forgot about the people. This, this idea of reconciliation is so important to God. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Jesus said this. He was telling a story, and he said, he said that if you are bringing a sacrifice to God, which is the same thing as if you are worshiping God, that's what they would have recognized. If you're sitting there and you're worshiping God and you know that someone has something against you, he said, leave your sacrifice or leave your worship there. You get up. You go make it right. Then come back and worship. Essentially saying that when it comes to this idea of reconciliation, worship comes second. Show me any other topic in the Bible where God would put the worship of himself below something. It's the only one. That's how important this idea of reconciliation is to God. That's how important it is. It is so important. So, the only way to really engage this culture the way God has called us to is to put down the signs and pick up a phone, give somebody a call. Meet them where they need you most. And let me tell you this. I'm a little tired of 
this idea that if we put the right person in the political office that something's going to change. I'm a little tired of it. And here's why I'm tired of it. Not that I don't think we should try and get good Christian men and women into office. That's not that at all. But here's why I'm tired of it. Do you realize in the Old Testament the children of Israel were given a law? And that law was written by God himself. So by definition, if a law is written by God, it more than likely is perfect in its morality, in its love, in its compassion. It's perfect. It's written by God. It's a perfect law. And you know what? Children of Israel couldn't do any of it. <laughs> they couldn't follow it if their life depended on it. They spent... 70, they spent hundreds of years in exile because they couldn't fulfill the law. They couldn't do what God asked them to do. A per, we could change every law on the books in this country. Every single one. Every one that drives us insane. And there are lots. Every one of them. We can change them all to be exactly what we think is right. Here's the kicker. First of all, there's not even one law that every Christian will agree should be that way. We can't even agree amongst ourselves what those laws should be. But even if we did, and even if we changed all those laws, you know what? That doesn't change anything because people are still fallen and people have no ability to do that whatsoever. I haven't found anywhere in that Bible, not one place, where anything major happened because a law was changed. But lots of really cool things happen when the people of God go to a people that are suffering and reconcile them to God. Lots of cool stuff happens. Now this book is full of countless stories like that. One more example, and then we'll pray. If you read in the book of Matthew, I think it's in chapter 10, we have to see this list of Jesus' apostles, and you see two, two names there that really are kind of, you, they really shouldn't be together. You have Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. So if you understand the history of that the zealots were a sect of Jewish people that they got around and had meetings and gathered weapons for the sole purpose of attacking Rome and attacking the culture and anyone who worked for Rome Matthew is a tax collector who worked for Rome in taking money from the Jewish people and giving it to the Roman people so by definition Simon the zealot the minute he saw Matthew should have stuck a knife in him. But instead, those two men radically transformed the world. Why? Because we do know of something that changes people. The power of the gospel changes people. Meeting Jesus face to face changes people. And that's why the Apostle Paul said this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. So I'm going to preach it. And I'm going to share it. And I'm going to engage the culture with the gospel, not another logical argument. Not another war of words. I'm going to engage the culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the mission of the church. The purpose of the church is not a place where we can get together and sing some songs. It is to engage the culture with the gospel. So let's ask a couple of questions personally. Am I actively engaging in this victim culture? 
Am I trying to win arguments instead of winning people? There's a good, easy way to answer that question. Look at your social media discussions and see what they entail. And if you spend more time trying to support your own rights than you do just telling people about Jesus, then we might want to think about some things. Here's one for you. Have I gotten so cynical? This is the one where the Lord convicted me pretty hard. Have I gotten so cynical that it has become entertaining to me to watch this culture burn itself to the ground? To watch people consume each other? If you get into, if you've gotten to the point where that doesn't phase you at all and break your heart, you've become cynical and calloused. Because the Bible says that, that those things break the heart of God. Are there people in my life right now that I can and should reach a hand out and show them the path of peace instead of the path of war? It's interesting if you look at 1 Corinthians 1 and you go down and it talks about Paul's talking about unity and he's talking about how there's divisions among them and in the, the English language doesn't do that very much justice it actually, actually, the word actually means that the goddess of war has been leashed or unleashed in your midst it's a very powerful statement that it, within the church the goddess of war has been unleashed in the church and unleashed in our midst are there people in the church even? Make it real personal, right? Forget the world for a second. Are there people in the church that we need to reach out a hand of peace instead of a hand of war? Maybe, maybe not. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. And God, again, I come to you <clears throat> fully convicted of my own foolishness. And God, I confess before you and before these people that I have found it much easier to just let the culture devour itself and sit back and I'll, I'll read my Bible and I'll preach from my pulpit and I'll do those things, but don't, don't let me get too involved in that culture because it's just, it, there's no hope for that. And God, when I get to a point where I feel that there's no hope for that, then I've lost the point of the gospel altogether because the gospel is hope. And God, I just ask that you would forgive me of that and you would renew in me a right spirit. You would renew in me this heart of compassion, this heart of, that breaks for people who don't know you, who don't know what that peace looks like, who don't know what what it means to be changed from the inside out. And God, I pray as a church, we would embrace our mission and our goal and our purpose to engage the culture with this gospel that is so life-transforming, that is so powerful, that it changes the very person that I am, that I am made a new creature in Christ Jesus. God, soften our hearts to the culture. Soften our minds. And God, let us not view people according to the flesh, but let, them, let us view them as people who are image bearers of God, full of value and dignity and honor and worth. And we would see them as you see them. God, as we go into this season, this holiday season, let us remember that you didn't just come into this world just to be a cute little baby that was born in a manger. But you, were, you came into this world 
to bring lost people back to you. That is the whole point. Let us never lose sight while looking at the baby Jesus. Never, never let us lose sight of the crucified Jesus.